Thank you so much. So it, you can tell Sandra wants to talk more about the project. So you can catch her on the break or the lunch hour, and you can hear all the stories. Um, she totally had more to say. So if you want to hear it, just catch Sandra. And I, we appreciate the work that you both are doing uh, for CSFS on blazing those new trails with the treatment center and the all clans houses. So, but without further delay, I would love to introduce, I'm so excited and honored to introduce uh, Dr. Val Napoleon. So we are excited to announce that our keynote speaker is Dr. Val Napoleon. She will be exploring the topic of intergenerational governance today. Dr. Napoleon, who is an Indigenous Peoples Council with an LLB and a PhD, is Cree from Soto First Nation and an adopted member of the Gitanyao Northern Gitsan. So while I'm introducing, oh, she's already up there. Um, she's the Acting Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria and is the Law Foundation Chair of Indigenous Justice and Governance. Her research area includes Indigenous legal traditions and methodologies, e.g. land and water governance, dispute resolution, etc., Indigenous democracy, and critical restorative justice. It is my honour to introduce Dr. Napoleon. Thank you. Please welcome her. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. This is uh, your, um, your organization is, is one that I've admired for uh, some time with just the scope and the depth of the work and the care with which everyone engages in that work. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for this invitation. I'm also grateful for the prayer the songs, the welcome to these lands, all of the ways that you've set out the, the, uh, the important nature of, of this coming together, of this gathering. I, I have a PowerPoint that you can see up here. Uh, and I was told uh, once that people listen better if they have something to look at. So I offer you, these are my paintings, they are trickster ravens, grandmother ravens. And as, as we uh, know, tricksters for most indigenous peoples around the world are one of the first law teachers. And she teaches us in many ways. Sometimes she teaches us with love and kindness and other times she'll slap us upside the head. So here is the, the trickster. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from the north, as, as you heard in the introduction, and, but I've been in the south for a long time in Victoria. And so I was on the plane and I had my big winter coat because I thought I'm going into winter. <laughs> And this very kind man in the next seat behind me said, that's a really big coat. And I said, yes, I'm a wuss from Victoria. And, and then he was, he was very kind and he said, well, it does get chilly in the morning. <laughs> Trying to make me feel better there, anyway. Um, so here we have uh, intergenerational governance and indigenous law. So the things that I want to cover in the time that I have, I want to talk about the role of indigenous law, which is basically the role of law in any society. And, but for indigenous peoples, there are specific ways to understand and think about law, including the fact that our societies were non-state. They weren't organized. Uh, in a hierarchical, centralized way that uh, Canada is, is organized into. I want to share also the work of with Indigenous Law, which we've been doing for a lot of years at the University of Victoria and in our work across the country. And you, you also may know that we have the only Indigenous Law degree program in the world. So students graduate after four years with an Indigenous law degree and a Canadian law degree. And I want to uh, talk a little bit about what, how does this work go into the future? What is it that we're all going to have to take up uh, from our various places in the work that we do? So some starting ideas. 
No society can exist without law. It's the fact of being a society that, that uh, is organized through law. And indigenous peoples, as you heard earlier, are no different than other societies around the globe. We were lawful peoples. We had ways of managing our affairs and taking care of ourselves and one another. So Justice Murray Sinclair talks about uh, how um, it's one way, it's a way that people decide what's right and what's wrong. What's acceptable and what isn't? It, you know, what, what is it that we're going, to, we're going to consider wrong? Similarly, we can't govern without law. It's a central part of how we structure our political organization, our organizing uh, work with one another, and it's integral to being a people. Whether we're Cree, whether we're Gixan, whether we're Sikwapmek, or whoever we are, it's also hardwired into our economies. So historic economies of the carrier or the Sakani or the Dakalf or the other peoples, all of our peoples had law and all of our peoples had economy and they're integ integrally tied to one another. So these are just starting ideas, including the fact that our societies historically had to take care of all the business, all of the messy business of human beings living together. So our, you know, the law of our peoples look different according to our societies and our histories and so on, but we still, all those laws had to do the hard work of law because the kinds of things that we had to deal with, including power imbalances, um, abuses of power, violence, and so on, we had to deal with those. And there's never a time where our societies didn't need law. So these are just a list of some of the work that law does in our society, and I'm going to skip that. And these are the elements. What is it then that law has to be able to do? And our societies had, you know, as has been mentioned, sacred law and customary law and um, all of that. But we also had deliberative law. We had law that comes from authorities. So we had different ways of, of um, understanding the authority of law in our, in our societies. And we had different legal responses. And I'm going to give some examples of these so that you can see how they, they're working. So one of the starting places, and you know, this is uh, you know, drawing from the work that we do uh, you know, across Canada and in the north and different places in the world, some of the work that we do, uh, it means that we're looking at law from different historic societal lenses. And so where do you start? And it's really important, and you're already doing this with cultural and societal specificity. What's the legal issue according to this legal perspective? So not Canadian, not someone else's, not some pan-Indigenous, but from this legal order. Who are the authoritative decision makers? And there's always a range, because there's different kinds of problems that we've had to deal with. And what are the legal institutions? And you've already been mentioning uh, you know, a number of them, the butlats, the clans. There's also families, different societies, organized law to operate through different institutions. That, that was the way that we structured ourselves. Law doesn't happen outside of human institutions. It operates through them. So when we look at Canada, for instance, and the institutions there, that's one way of operating. But we can look at all of the different ways that our own societies organized that law. And what's considered legitimate? What are legitimate processes then to respond to different kinds of legal issues, whether it's you know, a, a, a conflict, whether it's a harm, whether it's a, a, a management uh, question over how we deal with uh, different resources? These all require responses that we had historically. We've looked at, for instance, how Gwich'in women manage resources in the north through berry picking. 
and all of the different ways that decisions are made in order to prevent conflict over those, those territories. So, you know, as another starting place, um, again, we, we have historic uh, oral histories, we have stories, we have uh, reminiscences, we have the previous generation teaching the current generation how to, what, what the resources are, but each current generation has to solve the problems before it. And those problems are different than those of the previous generations. So that's the work of law. That's what happens within each generation. And it means looking at, from that generation's perspectives, what are the legal precedents? And what's the range of sanctions? What are the remedies? So these are all part of our legal orders historically. When there's more than one legal order, such as in the north where we, had Dun we have Dunyza and Cree people living together in similar communities, or in the same communities as in my community, then you have to look at more than one legal perspective because this has been a place where there ha can be conflict in recent times because colonization has sped up the interaction between societies. So that, and that has been um, generated kinds of the new uh, kinds of conflicts. But it's something that our societies have always had to deal with is intersocietal relations. Gender, it's one of the things that I think needs to be built at the ground level of every um, legal project, indigenous legal project. And so it's always a matter of asking whose voices are heard, what are the, what are the different ways that power is a part of the relationships. There we, the reality is that we do have uh, indigenous male privilege. It's one of the ways that um, one of the things that, that has been a part of our worlds. So we need to think about that and what are the consequences of it. And we need to think about how it enables us to see in, things in the world. One of the pieces here is that law is actually a, a grid. It enables us to see things and it makes other things invisible. So whether you're looking at Canadian law, it makes some things visible through that lens and it makes other things invisible. That's part of the battle that Indigenous peoples have been having with the Canadian legal system. But our own legal orders do the same thing. They create another lens. And so we need to look at what is that and what are the, what are the ways that it works. This is why it's important. Because there's many ways that uh, sexism is experienced. We, uh, we know like there's missing and murdered uh, indigenous women from my community as well as on Highway 16 and elsewhere and, and uh, these communities. So at one end, we have missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. We have that violence. But this is a spectrum. And at the other end are the, the, the forms of sexism that enable that violence, that enable the conditions. So this is the work of law. It's the work of indigenous law. And it's always a part of how we need to be looking at any area of law, whether it's land, whether it's water, whether it's governance, or any of the other work that law has to do in our, in our societies and our families. So I skipped one uh, slide there about the complexity of law because the, the, the kinds of legal problems we have require different roles for different legal decision makers and those we had historically in our, in our laws. So whether it's Cree or Gixan or others, that's, we had that specificity and I can answer any questions that you may have for further clarity on that. But I wanted to get to this story um, because stories are, they contain the precedents, they contain information which sometimes we look at them and we think, oh, those are really simple. But when you work with them, there's much wisdom and there's much richness and, and depth uh, there. So this story about Otterman, it's a Danisa story. 
It's about how a river otter lures a young Denise woman away and she takes her to his home at Charlie Lake and a lot of you might know Charlie Lake by Fort St. John. So she becomes his wife, they have children, those children are half otter, half human. And then uh, her brothers want to contact her and they contact uh, otter man through dreams. And then through that contact, they reunite. And they reunite and they bring the children into connection with their kin. So that's, uh, this is a story that was recorded um, by Robin Riddington a long time ago. But let's look at how this story might be told today. We have a dynamic Cree musician. He meets a Deniza woman when he was touring, and she goes back to Montreal with him, and they have children who are Cree and Deniza. But she doesn't keep in touch with her family, and so they worry about her because they don't know what's going on, and there's, there's missing and murdered indigenous women, so they want to know what's going on. So her brothers, who are real whizzes with technology, they, they figure out how to connect to her through her cell phone, even though she has blocked their calls. So they're able to contact her, and through that contact, they're able to reunite with the family, and they're able to bring the children into their, into their kinship, into their families. So it looks like a, a simple story. So one of the ways that we work with stories on different legal problems is we take, you know, like 10 or 20 or 40, sometimes 60 stories, and we look at and we analyze those and we ask questions about what's really going on in this story. Why was this so important that our ancestors maintained this story for thousands of years? So let's look at some of the principles that we can draw out of an analysis here. So that there's, we can see that there's some facts, we can see that there's uh, decisions that have been made about contacting and reconnecting, um, and we can see the reasoning. Okay, one of the differences between uh, what's a legal reasoning process and, and other ways into stories is that for for law, you have to provide your reasons, whether it's indigenous law or any other law. You have to talk about the why of the decisions. And so there's, you know, part of what you can see, which would have been driving the brothers, is that children are a part of the community and they can continue to be a part of another community at the same time. So they're looking at families across difference. So it's one of the, one of the ways that people are making decisions here. There are also uh, things that we're not sure about yet that we don't have all the information on. And so we can set those aside until we have an opportunity to learn more about what's going on. But we can look at, you know, we can break it down, we can look inside the story at different ways of understanding it. And then we can look at what are the guiding legal principles that we can take from that story to work with today. And this is where the work really matters. It really matters to implementation, it matters to to how we approach uh, legal problem solving or agreements with government or environmental assessments or any other numbers of things that people are doing. So we can look at, there's guiding legal principles about generosity in this story as well as a number of other stories that I analyzed. There's, there's principles about people being legal agents. That means they, you know, they have the will to participate in the, the decisions in their lives. You can also see that there's principles about independence and reciprocity. There are principles about how to make alliances and about relationships. There are other principles about how people, each individual member of a community contributes. And then the ones that I think are really important insofar as dealing with conflict have to do with the, the responsibility. When there's incompatibility with another people, there's a responsibility to um, 
negotiate, uh, to recognize the, the incompatibility, but to negotiate how to live together separately. And then the, the other uh, last proposition is that when there's incompatibility and it's dangerous, then you have to figure out a way to deal with the danger. So, you know, we can look at Otterman, and so I looked at probably about a hundred stories here, and you can you can break it down, and you can look at what are the legal principles that we can take away that can help us form responses for today's uh, kinds of challenges. The stories they look simple, they're complex, they're wise, and. Every generation has to interpret them differently to, to deal with the problems that they have of the day. Here's another story. An old Cree man who was a powerful shaman heard Sioux woman laughing one day. He got mad because he thought she was laughing at him. He cursed her. And she didn't hear him, but she became sick and crazy before Christmas, and began to turn into a wheat to go. A wheat to go is, a, you know, in Cree and Anishinaabek, uh, someone who becomes harmful, but it also enables people to deal with those that become harmful. So her children became afraid of her. Sue Woman's mother saw this, and she attempted to cure her daughter. She sent the children away to, while she worked to heal her. So a few of the adults stayed with her. And then when the daughter was cured, the grandchildren came back, the other people came back, and then the shaman died within a few days of Sioux woman being cured. So there's a little story. It's another one that looks simple, right? So here are principles that have been drawn from a lot of Cree stories. Hadley Friedland uh, is someone I've worked with for a lot of years, and this is drawing on her work. So in her work of Cree stories, there are principles regarding healing. Did you hear healing in the little story about Sioux woman? Yeah, healing was a part of it. What about separation or avoidance to deal with the problem? Did you hear that? She was sent away and some of the people went with her. So you can look at how the story had this principle in it. You also saw supervision where there was taking charge and looking after and organizing a situation. We saw natural and spiritual uh, consequences with the, the shaman getting sick and dying. What about acknowledging responsibility? Was there any evidence of that? Not really. That didn't happen. Reintegration? Not so much. Uh, incapacitation? Well, that it happened through natural consequences when the shaman got sick. And retribution? No. So it, the story doesn't meet all of those different uh, principles, but it meets some of them, and you can, you can look at how that, that works. So if we look at a current telling of this story, let's, let's see what happens with the current telling. Thomas Shaman, a known drug dealer, got together with Penny Sue Woman. She began using drugs. Thomas heard Penny laughing one day. He got mad because he thought she was laughing at him, and he cursed her. She became sick and crazy before Christmas and began to turn into a wheat to go, and her children became afraid of her. When Penny's mother saw that her daughter was beginning to turn into a wheat to go, she attempted to cure her. The children were taken away, and a few of the adults stayed with her. And then when her daughter is cured, the grandchildren come back. They live happily after that. The Thomas Shaman died within four days, and Sue Woman uh, was cured. Everyone was relieved. So that's a contemporary telling. And again, you know, like if we went back to the principles of healing, separation, or avoidance, 
supervision and so on, we can see those being acted out in the story. So the, this is um, just an example of two stories, how we can learn from them to deal with the, the big issues that are before us. It's one of the ways that historically our peoples uh, organized our legal resources was through stories. They're available there for us to draw on. And we need to work with them in their fullness and complexity, like not turn them into parables, not turn them into fairy tales, but rather they, they, they need to do the work of law, the hard work of law. There are... Um, Oops, I'm going backwards. That's no good. Here we go. One of the, the um, aspects of working with Indigenous law, and I just wonder how much, one minute left, okay. So our law has, our laws have aspirations. All of our peoples had aspirations for what we wanted our communities and our societies to be like. When we worked across Canada with different peoples across Canada, Cree, Anishinaabek, uh, Sikwepmek, and so on, these were the aspirations that were shared across very different legal orders. People wanted fairness through their laws. That's what they wanted to create. People wanted safety, inclusion, dignity, and legal agency. So these are ways forward, ways to organize, um, and ways to uh, inform and guide ourselves. And all of our societies had legitimacies. So part of the work is to ask, what, how do we understand legitimacies? If we don't find legitimacies in our own laws, and if we don't figure out what is it that's legitimate to everyone, then people won't follow them and we'll, we'll, we'll have the continuing problems with colonization. So the commitment that I've heard here is, is about people doing the hard work with law. It's not easy, it is really hard work, but it's the only way forward, I think, for indigenous peoples. It's the only way forward for all of our futures. Um, so the last slide here. My colleague, Darcy Lindbergh, who's Cree, he teaches Cree constitutional law. He said, well, he's talking about different legal orders here, and he says, what if all the stars mattered? Not just Canadian stars, but all the stars from different peoples across the country. And so the work then is about learning to see each other's stars, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Napoleon. I think we have a couple minutes for questions, if there are any questions. I think there's some mics. Are there mics in the room that people in the room can um, ask a question? Oh, yes, yeah, so up here, there's a mic right, behind, right beside this table here with Emily. And you can run. And if there's any questions online, I think that uh, um, the communications team will relay them. So Emily, is that a question online? Okay. Um, hello, can you hear me? Can anybody? Oh, hello. Can you hear me now? Maybe. Yes. Okay. I can hear. Great. Yeah. Um, well, just Dr. Napoleon, you have a fan online, and uh, this is from Amy Williams, and she says, "Dr. Bell, love to see you again after such a long time." <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and there's a question over here, Wolf. Yeah. Has Val the um, the story that you mentioned? Oh, by the way, congratulations on your appointment uh, with the Sioux uh, woman and the shaman. What I saw was that there's a misunderstanding and an assumption, and in the stuff that. Uh, you said, I didn't see those. Because <clears throat> it just popped right into my head when, when you, you read those stories. You know, the shaman just assumed 
but or or the Yasu woman assumed that the uh, shaman was or who was laughing at who, but one of them was laughing at the other one. The other one thought it was uh, the one that was laughing at, and. Has that been taken into consideration of uh, misunderstanding or assumptions like that? So one in, of in the law that you're talking about. So one of the things that uh, is thank you for that question. One of the things that is is important is that the stories will tell you different things depending on the kind of question you ask. So so this. Uh, was looking at harms and injuries. So Hadley looked at lots and lots of stories about harms and injuries. And so this was the particular analysis. And for sure, you can look at you know, what happens when, there's, when there's people act on assumptions without uh, learning more about what is really going on, absolutely. So that's, that's one of the pieces in the analysis, as well as looking at what are the legal principles, what are the Cree legal principles here that we can take from that story and, and act on in other situations where there's problems and conflicts and, and injuries. So, um, the, 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 you know, like when you look at legal cases, Canadian legal cases, you have to be specific about what question you're going to ask about it. Anybody here with a legal education will see that. And the stories are, are just as complex. Like Canadian law in all of the cases are basically a whole bunch of stories that are drawn upon for different reasons, for different questions. And our precedents are similarly a way of organizing information for future recall because our brains work better with stories than they do with lists, right? So looking at the stories as resources, things we can learn from for all kinds of questions is, is making sure that we're using our own legal resources and questioning each other about what do you see and what don't you see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Warner, I'd like to invite Warner up. And I just want to say, is there anybody else besides me who wants to go to law school at UVic now? Ju Julie. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Listen, I went to law school when I became a grandmother. What can we community members do to help the process along for our own reservations to better understand for those who want to learn the laws? Thank you uh, so much. I. You know, the, the work with law, if we think about Indigenous law, it's, it's everybody's business. It's because we're not, our laws aren't organized like Canada's where you have dedicated professionals and centralized institutions that, that uh, contain the authority for law. Our societies had, the stories were available to everybody. Everybody could look at them and could interpret you know, ways of understanding and learning in order to act on the world around them. Law is one way that we create meaning in the world. It's a way that we understand the world. It's a way that we interpret things. So what, um, what I would encourage everyone to do is to start looking at what are the legal resources that are available, the, the different um, some of it's going to be written down, some of it's going to be oral, and start to draw those together. Um, if you go to our website, which is the Indigenous Law Research Unit at the University of Victoria, we have resources there. We also teach methodology courses, so one-month courses for people to, uh, for community members and others to, to learn the skills of analysis, and then how to put them together around different areas of work that communities can use. Thank you. So remember that law is, our laws are, is everybody's business. And uh, I think there's nothing more than uh, us carriers, Wet'suwet'ens and Sakani's is, uh, is minding all that business, right? Um, so thank you so much. Um, and, oh, Ray, you have a question? Yes, uh, Ray Morris, uh, Nee Tribin. Is there uh, the uh, oral governance 
and oral history. How do you relate those two? How does it should it stay intact going forward? Great question. <clears throat> it's it's something. <clears throat> pardon me. It's something that people around the world are talking about. This is a question that was asked in South Africa, like what happens when you write things down was one of the questions. But here's the thing. Our people organized those oral histories and recorded them in many, many, many ways through, uh, through, diff through crests, through um, oral histories, through names, through uh, reminiscences, through um, images, different kinds of uh, societal expressions. So this is the work that our, like law has to be recorded and our people did that so that the next generation would have them. We had our own ways of doing that. Today we have another way, which is text, which has got its own limitations. So in addition, it I think needs to be combined with other ways of interpretation, which is why everybody questioning and everybody discussing is, is an important part of the work of law itself. It's not just writing it down and forgetting. You ha it has to live in everybody's lives and in everybody's experiences in how we solve problems. Some of the work that I did in Gitanyao, uh, you know, we were working with stories. One of the stories had the kidnapping of a Haida chief and that chief died in custody. And then there was a feast and he was treated, the funeral was for a, for a feast. And one of the young women, she must have been about 20, was part of that uh, discussion in the community. And she said, wait a minute, I don't get it. Like why kidnap him and then treat him like a feast with this funeral when he dies? So what happened was that everybody in the community started to talk about that. And that is the teaching of law through her ability to ask a question for people taking it seriously and from their own perspectives and experiences offering their understanding, right? So that discussion was, you know, didn't take away from the fact that the story was also written down. It had to live and still needs to live in our hearts and our minds, and we need to make it part of our internal lives. We have to internalize it too, so that we're lawful. Thank you. Warner. Let's thank Dr. Napoleon for her words today. So on behalf of the board and the chiefs and the carrier people, thank you very much for that delivery. Um, and it just reminded me about um, the teachings of my grandmother. She would tell us legends and those legends were t teaching us the laws of who we are as Nanudin people. So it really sparked that memory in me. Um, and just moving forward, we will have uh, Val Napoleon's team come and do some workshops around reclaiming our laws and how to develop laws in our within the child welfare sector. So we'll see more of her team in the communities. Um, again, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, looking forward to that. So we are moving into a break right now. I want to give you um, a couple housekeeping. Make sure your phones are muted. You can use the break to return the calls or whatever, but when you come back, please mute your phones. And um, we're gonna come back from the break at 10.25, and we'll start off your break with a short video.